Sorry about the lack of a hoodie today, guys. It's um, it's, it's in the wash. <laughs> anyway, if Taito's known for one thing, it's making cute, fun, addictive, and incredibly difficult games like Bubble Bobble. They've got a ton of lesser-known games that nobody seems to ever heard of. Games like The New Zealand Story and Kiwi Craze. Well, the New Zealand Story is Kiwi Craze. Anyway, we're gonna play it until we win. It's like Bubble Bobble, but the jumping mechanics are a bit off. It's like Bubble Bobble, but the levels are mazes and not simple screens of enemies. It's like Bubble Bobble, but the weapons actually kill the enemies instead of trapping them in bubbles. You get my point. This doesn't mean Kiwi Craze is an inferior game. In fact, it holds up pretty well against its popular counterpart. Of course, this isn't a game that you're going to beat in one sitting. Oh no, Kiwi Craze is deceptively difficult and evil. Pure, horrifying evil. For starters, you've got a limited number of lies and continues. Once you're out, it's back to the beginning of the game. One hit and you're dead. There's no life bar and hardly any room for error. Make one full step and it's game over. The levels are long and they're all timed. Yeah, much like Bubble Bobble, if you take too long to complete a level in Kiwi Craze, a crazy demon pops up on the screen and will hunt you down and kill you. So not only do you have to complete these long levels, you have to do it fast. Most of the later levels can be downright maddening with jumps that you must make that just simply aren't easy. While we're on the topic of levels, there are a ton of them. There are five worlds with four levels each for a total of 20 levels you've got to get through. And they're not the small one screen levels either, oh no, we're talking Super Mario Brothers sized levels. There are almost no one-ups in this game. I ran across maybe one during the entire game. Whether they're hidden or not, I just don't know. The bosses can be a problem, especially if you're not ready to dodge an unreasonable amount of projectiles on the screen. Fortunately, they all have a simple pattern and can be beaten with a little memorization. There are a lot of different things that can kill you in this game, but how do you stay alive? First, get used to the jumping mechanic. It seems weird to say it, especially with such a simple mechanic, but jumping isn't the easiest thing in the world in this game, especially when you're asked to jump through some pretty tight spaces surrounded by instant death spikes. Different weapons do different things. You start off with arrows, can acquire bombs, and can eventually move up to wall-penetrating lasers. Always keep in mind what weapons you've got, because they all behave differently. If you get stuck in a level or find that you're constantly running out of time, then you might want to try a different direction to go in. While going to the right may seem like the natural thing to do, often going to the left and around or down and up is the easier route to take. Don't get fooled, this game is pure evil. Just when you think you've got a level figured out, the game will throw a curveball at you and stick a spear chucking enemy directly beneath you, ruining your day. When all else fails, you probably just need to move your Kiwi through the level faster. This is especially true in the later levels as the mazes get larger and the timer gets shorter. Alright, so with 20 levels in this game, there's no possible way I'm going to be able to explain all of them without this being a two hour long epic episode. And I'm way too fat and lazy to make something that long. So I'm just going to go over the basics of each world and tell you how to take out the bosses, okay? Okay. World 1. For the most part, this entire world is straightforward, and you're not going to run into too many obstacles. If you have any experience with Bubble Bobble and Super Mario Brothers, you're going to do just fine. Just keep a couple of things in mind. Enemies aren't bright, but they have a few surprises up their sleeves. The shelled enemies can fire green rolling balls, and the blue guards can throw weapons and jump down on top of you. You'll be introduced to flyers in this world. They're enemies that fly around on various floating objects and shoot projectiles at you. If you shoot the clouds, they'll fall down and die, but if you shoot the enemies, you'll be able to commandeer the cloud they're flying on and float around the level. You'll need to use this skill much more later on in the game, so practice with it for now. At the end of World 1-4, instead of releasing your trapped Kiwi friend, you'll be forced to face off against the boss. Now this guy isn't that big of a problem. You won't be able to hurt him with your attacks, so just avoid the projectiles for now, 
and then let him eat you. Yeah, that's right, I said that. Let him eat you. You'll be inside his belly and be able to attack him from the inside. Just make sure you avoid the belly juices falling from his interior or you'll die. Keep shooting and eventually you'll kill the whale and save your kiwi friend. World 2. You'll also run across a lot of spikes in this area and you'll be forced to fly over them with a cloud. Be careful and take your time here because you'll be doing this a lot in the game. Here's a little trick that'll help you get past the spikes. If the bottom of the cloud even glances across a spike tile, you'll fall to your death. However, you have some leeway when it comes to your head. You can safely touch spikes with the very top of your head, but just don't go too far, otherwise you die. In World 2-3, you'll do a fair bit of swimming, and you'll notice that the score at the bottom of the screen suddenly turns into a quickly depleting meter. Yeah, you've got a really limited amount of breath while underwater. Here, you're going to run into three major problems. Spikes, grabbers, and bubbles. The spikes are self-explanatory as they kill you instantly. The grabbers are these huge green tentacle monsters that reach out and try to grab your little kiwi. You can usually avoid these things by simply swimming far enough away from them. They have a long reach though, so watch out. Finally, the bubbles. If you've played other NES games, you may think that you can simply swim into the bubbles and recover some breath. You'd be wrong. The bubbles in this game only get in your way and stop you from recovering your breath in the small pockets of air you'll find while underwater. The boss in this world is a giant octopus, and he's a big pushover. He moves in a pattern and fires bats out of his mouth. I don't know, just go with it. Anyway, just keep shooting so that he doesn't hit you and avoid touching the octopus. After many, many hits, he'll go down. World 3. In this world, you're basically going to swim everywhere. It's fun at first, but you'll soon realize that swimming makes you move slower, and since you've got a limited amount of breath, you've got to stop every once in a while just to catch it. It wouldn't be a problem in other games, but you're working against the clock. This world, unlike the first two, is more maze-like. For example, in worlds 3-2, 3-3, and 3-4, you're generally going to have to go up and around in order to reach the center of the maze to find the trapped kiwi. The trick to surviving underwater from here on out is to time your stops for air carefully. Really what you want to do is maximize the amount of time you're moving versus the amount of time you've stopped waiting to recover your breath. If you stop at every gap, you'll eventually run out of time, so you'll only want to stop when you're on the brink of drowning. The boss in this world is a giant statue, and he's probably the most difficult boss in the entire game. He moves around the screen and fires five bullets in a spread pattern, and avoiding the bullets can be a real challenge. When the fight first starts, quickly move to the right of the screen and get near the platforms. Fire at the statue constantly while jumping around the bullets. This isn't as easy as you might think, though, especially when the statue starts to fire bullets in rapid succession, trapping you in a corner. Keep at it, though, and you'll eventually destroy the statue. World 4. This world is a combination of a lot of flying and a lot of swimming. Plus, from World 4 to onward, each level will have multiple paths to take. This is also where the game takes a sharp right and increases in difficulty to crazy levels. Levels 4-1, 4-2, and 4-3 can be beaten pretty easily if you're careful with how you fly around on the clouds and how often you stop to get air while swimming. In these levels, all you really want to do is follow the arrows on the wall as quickly as possible without falling onto spikes or drowning. The biggest problem you'll run into in these levels is running out of time. There are multiple paths in each level, but only one correct path. That means that if you take a wrong turn, you're pretty much guaranteed to run out of time. Levels 4-2 and 4-3 are pretty difficult, but in their own ways. Level 4-2 is long, only because you've got to swim through a very large portion of it, and that means you've got to time your stops for air. Essentially, what you want to do in this level is move down, right, up, and around to the center of the map. Level 4-3 is much shorter, but it's damn hard. You've really got only one way to go, but be prepared to go through hell to get to the end. Where you're really going to hate life is level 4-4. Believe me. You're going to die. A lot. This level is not only difficult with having a ton of deadly spikes haphazardly strewn about, but it's also long, split into two parts. You're going to have to learn a lot of things quickly if you want to make it through this stage without taking the cart out of your NES and smashing it to bits. First things first, there are these blocks with arrows on them. They move in the direction of the arrow as soon as you touch them. 
Usually, it's a down arrow, and usually that means the block is going to send you to your death in some unholy fashion or another. Next on the list of things you need to learn is the double tap jump. There are several sections in this level where a full jump is going to kill you, and where a standard standing jump will kill you too. What you need to do is the double tap jump. Essentially, you move forward, tap jump lightly, land on a small platform, and while you still have forward momentum, lightly tap the jump button again. It takes a lot of time to get used to this maneuver. Finally, the last thing you need to learn about is this damn jump. It's a combination of a block that falls onto spikes down a shaft lined with spikes, and you've only got a very small square to maneuver through. This kind of shit rivals games like I Wanna Be The Guy or Asshole Mario. I'm not gonna lie here, the only way you're gonna get through this level is practice. You're gonna burn through a lot of lives and a lot of continues just trying to get through this part. Oh, and did I mention that there are no checkpoints? You die, you go back to the beginning of the level. Oh yes, this game is evil. Thankfully though, there's no boss in this world. I couldn't imagine anything being harder than those spike traps anyway. World 5. The last level is a doozy, but it doesn't have the platforming trickery of 4-4. In fact, every stage here is more of a maze than a difficult platformer. In 5-1, your general path is to go right, up, around, then down. There are only a few sticking points here, aside from learning the layout of the level and making your way through. The volcano has these pits that shoot lava up into the air. They're randomly timed, but at fixed intervals, if that makes any sense. Essentially, the volcano won't fire another bit of lava until the other one has at least cleared the screen. You'll also need to keep in mind that most of the enemies will not hurt you unless they hit you with a projectile of some sort. So you can safely jump up in tight spaces with enemies in them, so long as they aren't shooting at you. And so long as they aren't those white bastards that do kill you if you touch them. There's a bit of an asshole moment in this level where, near the end, you'll have to jump down a long shaft into a group of three blue enemies. You'll need to get lucky here and kill the enemies quickly because they like to throw boomerangs. You need to get lucky, of course, because there's a good chance that one of the three bad guys will throw a boomerang before you've landed, killing you before you get a chance to kill them. Nice. Level 5-2 is a maze, plain and simple. The easiest way to get through this level is to always descend. And actually, getting through this maze isn't all that complicated, since dead ends mean you just need to backtrack. It's the small, hidden places you need to jump to in order to cross to the next section that will eat up most of your time. Make sure you pay attention to any walls that might be in your way and see if you can't jump behind them from below. I know it sounds strange, but your little Kiwi can do some amazing things. Keep on going down into the right and eventually you'll free your little Kiwi friend. Stage 5-3 is another maze, but it's deceptively simple. You'll die more than a few times trying to figure this one out, but really all you need to do is steal a cloud from an enemy and head up and to the right. Stage 5-4 starts off with a very nice sign. You've reached the finale. All of the surfaces here are ice, but thankfully getting through this stage isn't as bad as you might think. Yeah, the level is hard, especially some of these platforming sections on tiny blocks of ice played over deadly spike pits, but... Once you're able to steal a cloud from an enemy, you'll be able to breeze through the rest of the level and face off against the final boss, the Walrus. He appears on the left side of the screen. All you have to do is fire shots at his balloon while avoiding his arc shots. Now the ice also gives you momentum every time you land from jumping, so you'll have to move back to the right side of the screen frequently in order to stay far enough away from the Walrus to be safe. Keep shooting his balloons and eventually... Isn't that just a wonderful end screen? Can you imagine playing this in the arcades and seeing that end screen after using an innumerable number of quarters to get there? And seeing that? Yeah. Yeah, I'd rage too. But then again, Taito never was known for their epic stories, were they?
and where a standard standing jump will kill you too. What you need to do is the double da da 